Space, brought to you by Orbital Assembly Corporation, with your hosts, Dr. Jeff Greenblatt and Eric Ward. Hello, and welcome to Our Future in Space. In this podcast, we explore the technical, economic, social, political, and ethical considerations of expanding into the solar system to thrive, to work, to play, and to explore. Humanity is now at an inflection point in our evolution where we now have the ability to uh, preserve and uh, uh, sustain life off planet in low Earth orbit, but soon throughout the solar system. Will we merely survive or will we expand outward and thrive? Orbital Assembly is leading the way in the development of artificial gravity stations so people can live, work, and thrive in space. OAC's platforms are market category creators. They are backwards compatible with current standards, allowing for you to move from concept to production at the pace of business. To learn more, visit orbitalassembly.com. All right. I am Dr. Jeff Greenblatt. I am your host. I'm also the vice president for science and research at Orbital Assembly. And I'm joined here by my co-host, Eric Ward, the Vice President for Engineering Design at Orbital Assembly. How's it going, Eric? Oh, it is just going great. We have another wonderful guest and a string of wonderful guests. Uh, today, we're joined by Dr. Dennis Wright. He retired in 2020 as a physicist in the Elementary Particle Physics Department of the Slack National Accelerator Laboratory at Stanford. He's attained a PhD in nuclear physics at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and has been involved in more than 20 experiments, including low energy photonuclear reactions, strong interaction experiments at Los Alamos, the Atlas experiment at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, and the Super CDMS search for dark matter. He's currently the vice president of the International Space Elevator Consortium, ISCC, where he works on simulating the physics of the space elevator, including its dynamics, electrodynamics, and the effects of radiation. He joined the ISCC in 2013. Dr. Wright, uh, thank you so much for coming. Welcome to our future in space. Thanks for having me. Um, good to see you, Eric and, and Jeff. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, for sure. So why don't we just start out at the basics so that we're all on the same page. Can you tell us what is a space elevator? Okay, um, imagine um, a cable, which is stretched from the surface of the Earth out to well past uh, geosynchronous orbit. And uh, there would be a elevator car essentially climbing up and down the space elevator to deliver payload and hopefully someday uh, personnel into space. And the whole thing that makes it work is that there's a uh, centrifugal force pulling outward at some point to counteract the, the gravitational force pulling down and that keeps everything tight and straight. And so um, that's that's the, the bare bones of it. And the physics of it is uh, pretty interesting. Yeah, well, I'm gonna bring up a diagram right now, Dennis, that I think will help people to visualize. It, it's um, maybe you can just walk us through this diagram that's uh, on the, toward the right side of the screen. Sure. So. Uh, the the scale is a well. This this could work for a, for a particular kind of counterweight, but um, the the scale is a little bit different than what we're talking about in in a lot of cases. But suppose you had uh, suppose you had a satellite at geosynchronous orbit, mm -hmm. and it's going to keep station with the with a a point on the Earth's equator. Yep. So it's orbiting the Earth at the same rate that the Earth is spinning. So yeah, it's always above the exact same spot in the equator. Okay. Right. Right. And now you take this satellite and imagine stretching it. So uh, infinitely elastic satellite and you keep stretching it outward and inward. And so eventually it touches the earth and the other part goes out and um, it's still going to maintain its position in geosynchronous orbit. But then when you attach it to the earth, the hmm. centrifugal force from the mass of the cable and the counterweight pull it outward and that keeps everything straight. And um, in fact, there is only one point now that you've done all this elongation that still is technically in orbit, and that's the point at geosynchronous. Everything else is uh, a, a kind of a driven orbit. Right. That is, they would want to move at different rates if they weren't connected together, but because it's a, and you're going to get into just how strong of a cable you're going to need, but because it's all linked together with a strong cable, it continues to rotate at one revolution per day. Right. 
Mm -hmm. so I just want to quickly mention, uh, for those people who are listening, not watching, on the left here, we've got a picture, I think that's of Silkovsky. That's right. So, the, yeah, go ahead. Oh, uh, I was just going to say, a lot of people who uh, either don't know about space elevators or have just heard about them think of them as this uh, modern, far future thing. But uh, Silkovsky was around in uh, the 1890s, and uh, he was actually the guy that came up with the rocket equation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it basically says the uh, uh, you increase the payload of the rocket, the mass of the whole rocket and launch system goes up exponentially with that. So um, he invented that. And then he also more or less around the same time, 1896, 1897, um, postulated that, uh, well, if you actually built a tower strong enough, you could launch things from mm -hmm. the end of that tower and get them into space, thereby defeating the rocket equation, if you will. Right. So not only did he, stuff. yeah, didn't he? Didn't he also invent the idea of a rotating space station for artificial gravity too? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So quite the seminal figure in in rockets and and space and and you know everything kind of we're doing that in uh, in low Earth orbit really in in a big way. Exactly. Huh? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, oh, sorry. Let's bring everybody back on here. Uh, too much moving around. So. Uh, all right, so we've identified kind of the very basics of what a space elevator is, and that it was discovered uh, more than 100 years ago by uh, Tsiolkovsky. M maybe just a little bit of history here. So uh, he, of course, wasn't the only person to um, uh, advance this idea to the point where it's at today, and I want to get to sort of where it's at today. But is there anybody else worth mentioning in history, either, you know, 100 years ago or more, more recently, who was instrumental in um, advancing this idea? Sure. I mean, he thought of, of, of basically the concept of how you would get into orbit, but he was thinking of a compressive tower. And so that obviously supporting the weight of the tower becomes uh, prohibitive after a while. And uh, the really serious concepts didn't start coming until the 60s and the 70s. And um, Yuri Artsitanov and Jerome Pearson were two of the people who were credited with the so-called modern space elevator, they said that it would have to be a cable. So instead of a compressive structure, it would have to be a tensile structure. Mm -hmm. And that was basically the first thing that people started to believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, of course, realized uh, Jerome Pearson was, was working for a, uh, an orbital tower uh, based on the moon mm -hmm. and other ways to launch satellites. Um, they, they realized that the material would have to be very, very strong. And in fact, much stronger than anything that was available at that time. And so it was pretty much uh, tabled for, for serious discussion until about 1991. I think that was the date of the discovery of carbon nanotubes. And they were found to have a tensile strength about 200 times stronger than steel. And at that point, people started to look at it again, in particular, Brad Edwards, who did a NASA advanced concept study in which he said, well, if you've got something that strong, you could conceivably make a tethered object based on, mm -hmm. or anchored on the Earth and a uh, counterweight uh, well beyond uh, geosynchronous orbit that would uh, function as a space elevator. And so those materials, the first, the carbon nanotube, uh, which you can see on the on the lower left here, uh, was around for a while, and people were able to grow that to lengths of about so oh, order of 10, 20 centimeters. So it actually got to be macroscopic in size. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, um, we're going to continue this conversation in a moment, but first, a word from our sponsors. Right back. Ideas are powerful things. Ideas drive us to broaden our minds and help us seek truth about the universe around us. We are Rogue Space Systems. Ideas above. So you mentioned it's got to be high strength. I can't just use a regular braided steel cable like in the elevator downtown. Right. So, so what kind of materials are we looking for if we're going to if we're going to build something like the space elevator? Um, you know, how how strong do they need to be? And, you know, and why? And, and what are our candidates there? Yeah. So the, uh, the carbon nanotubes had already demonstrated sufficient strength. 
and uh, other materials have shown up. So in 2006 was the discovery of graphene. And that was another breakthrough because now you have something which is essentially a 2D material. And there's a picture of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so graphene or another material, boron nitride, uh, are arranged in this hexagonal pattern. And they are basically uh, one atomic diameter thick. And they can be quite large. In 2007, 2008, uh, a sample of this was produced, which was about a half a meter long. So it really can be built. And it has uh, strength uh, uh, pretty much well in, ex well in excess of what we need for the space elevator. So it's going really? to really, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, it, there, would, there would be room for a safety factor of about one and a half and maybe two if we could use these materials. Um, just a quick question. And I want to hear what a safety factor is for those who aren't engineers. But before I ask that, so the difference between the graphene, you know, two-dimensional structure and the carbon nanotube, which kind of looks like a, a rolled up two-dimensional structure. I mean, what's the basic difference uh, between those in terms of how they perform? Like, why do we prefer uh, graphene over carbon nanotubes? Right. And of course, Brad Edwards' idea was to use the, the carbon nanotubes and they would be braided or woven in some way as to make a cable, but it would have to be uh, uh, roughly a flat cable or something resembling a ribbon. So there's a lot of work that you can imagine going into putting together a large number of carbon nanotubes into a ribbon. The nice thing about the 2D materials is that, well, it's already essentially what the ribbon would look like. The ribbon would be very two dimensional. We figure, of course, it would be very long, maybe 100,000 kilometers, but it would probably only be a meter wide. And mm -hmm. given the number of layers that you need to put together to make, let's say, a, a graphene ribbon, uh, it would be only a few microns thick. And that would be roughly 12,000 atomic layers to make the necessary thickness to support a 20 ton climber. Wow. I mean, I, that sounds like a lot of layers to me, but I'm assuming that it's not that hard to put that many together once you can make these large sheets of graphene, right? Well, that is the trick. We're still mm -hmm. at the point where we need to make the large sheets of graphene. So as I mentioned, uh, right now, about 50 centimeters is the longest that people have produced. There are um, companies now looking to produce these in, in, in um, uh, manufacturing methods so that we can run off um, kilometers of the stuff in a day. And obviously you're going to have to do that if you're going to make this hundred kilometers. Yeah. Yeah. A thousand kilometers. So yeah. People think that they can do this. And uh, the first step is to go from the polycrystalline graphene, which is fairly easy to make now, and turn that into single crystal graphene. So if you just, um, well, some of the processes that are used to make the, the graphene uh, one of which is uh, carbon vapor deposition. And essentially you are just um, bubbling uh, carbon atoms up through a hot metal and they assemble themselves on the top of this metal into uh, domains of graphene or graphite actually. Mm -hmm. And they assemble themselves into these domains and each of these domains is single crystal. So just like the idealized picture that you saw a little while ago, just a set of those carbon hexagons. And as time goes on, these domains grow into one another and they have domain boundaries. And so you want to get rid of that. You want to have one single crystal being formed. Okay. So perfection is, or near perfection is really important. And I'm guessing that has to do something with the strength of the material in its bulk form. Yeah, really, yes. really quick. Why don't we get into that? You mentioned factor yeah. safety earlier. Um, so tell our, tell our listeners where this, the need for the strength comes from, right? It's a really long cable. But it's sort of orbiting by itself at its center of gravity at geo. But it, we need to have the strength. Tell us a little bit about like kind of the math behind why we need such a high strength material. Right. The first thing is that it has to support itself. So mm -hmm. we're talking about uh, about a thousand tons. 
um, mm -hmm. of, of material just to build the space elevator itself. Thin as it is, it's still going to have some weight. And mm -hmm. that's a key. So the material uh, has to be both strong and light. And so the ratio of those two, the, the, uh, the um, uh, tensile strength divided by the density is the key thing that we're looking at. And okay. then you can build something which will support itself and a climber. And so mm -hmm. now that you've got something that's just supporting itself, you have to add uh, at least one climber. And we're thinking that these may be about 20 tons. And so several of those to make it economical, perhaps you'd have seven such climbers on the tether at any one time. So, those so you are have to support like all that weight. The the elevator cars, right? But we call them climbers because that cable stays in position and those climbers move up along the cable rather than that cable getting pulled up by the elevator. Mechanism. Right, right. Yeah, okay. And so at first you're just fighting gravity. Mm -hmm. That's that's the worst part of it. Getting getting up uh, <laughs> past a couple of earth diameters is, is the key. And then uh, you get a little help because this whole thing is rotating. And as you get out towards a uh, geosynchronous orbit, then the gravity is exactly balanced by the centrifugal force. Mm -hmm. Now at that point, it's kind of interesting because that is the point of maximum stress. So at that point, mm. the force outward due to the mass of the tether and the counterweight is exactly equal to the mass inward or to the force inward yeah. uh, due to the mass of the tether and the climbers. So, at that point, you can calculate the strength based on the number of, of uh, elevator cars or climbers. And it comes out to, oh, roughly speaking, let's see, we have uh, uh, a Young's modulus for this of uh, uh, one terapascal. And so we want to operate at about 10% of that for tensile strength. Okay. And to remind listeners, a terapascal is a very high pressure measurement. I mean, the Earth's atmosphere provides about 100,000 pascals of pressure, and you're talking 10 to the 12th. So right. And that's, that's just the Young, Young's modulus. So the, the actual tens yeah. tensile strength is uh, like 130 gigapascals. Oh, okay. And that's about but 200 still, times yeah. steel. Yeah. 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 Impressive. So... Okay, so that just comes from the basic uh, physics of, of, of how much it's being pulled on at that mm -hmm. geostationary point. Mm -hmm. And that sort of sets the scale for everything else that you need. So Right. Mm -hmm. Everything, the, the neat thing about the space elevator, it's linearly scalable. So theoretically, if you want to increase the amount of payload that you bring up, you make the space elevator tether that much bigger, proportionally bigger to the mass of the payload. Mm. Oh, when you say bigger, you don't mean stronger. You just mean thicker or wide, I mean, you wider. Can or, you can make it thicker or you can make it wider. The okay. critical element is the cross section of the tether. Mm -hmm. okay. So if you, so then the, if you want more mass in your climbers, you would linearly scale the cross section of that tether ribbon. That's yeah. right. And then the mass goes up with mm -hmm. that. So, so why a, a ribbon shape rather than a big round mm -hmm. cable? You mentioned that I, earlier, and yeah. you know, that, that makes me pretty curious here, of course. In terms of uh, mechanics, it makes very little difference. But in terms of survivability, there's a very interesting point there because you have to worry about micrometeorite impacts, um, orbital debris, things like that. Uh -huh. And it looks like, and people have, have said that uh, if you have a curved tether, that is the cross-section shape is, is a semicircle or something like that, or in fact, if it is a tube, then it's more likely to survive an impact because it has two places where the micrometeorite could go through and uh, it could still survive. If, if uh, you have a thin ribbon and you're unfortunate enough to have a micrometeorite go edgewise through that, which is, you know, probability, probabilistically not that great, but um, that would be a, a separation device you'd uh, have to worry about. Yeah, yeah, game over. Yeah. So um, while I have it, the image up here, uh, micrometeors is one of the top hazards listed here for those uh, people who aren't able to see the image. But can you tell us about some of the other hazards that uh, we have to concern ourselves with with these elevators? 
Sure. Um, right there at the top, you see uh, uh, induced oscillations. That's an important one to worry about. So this tether is stretched and it's stretched quite a lot. So it will be somewhat rigid, but still not rigid enough to get rid of all the vibrations that can happen in the tether. One of the interesting things is, is that the, the, uh, the climber is moving up. Uh, because of that motion, it will be subjected to Coriolis forces. And so it will want to go to the side and it will want to try to pull the, the space elevator tether to that side. And that induces oscillations, uh, which you have to worry about because you don't want them to build on themselves or to be in resonance with other bodies like the moon. So uh, uh -huh. this particular, if you build a space elevator uh, at 100,000 kilometers length and, and typical masses that we're thinking about, it has a rigid body period. That means it'll, it'll, it will uh, rock back and forth a lot like a pendulum anchored at the mm -hmm. earth. Mm -hmm. And that pendulum period works out to be about 5.8 days. If you were to change the mass of the climber or the mass of the space elevator or things like that, you would affect the period. And then if it's, for example, seven days, then you're a one in four, uh, <laughs> resonance with the moon. So you want to avoid that. And, and, uh, and uh, so oscillations are, are, are something you should worry about. Um, other things to are worry there, about. Mm, yeah. Sorry, just to drill in on that for a minute. So obviously you don't want something that's a, a small inter, inter, integer multiple or, or fraction of the moon's period, because then you can get these induced, um, uh, um, these resonant uh, frequency oscillations that don't dampen, but they get heightened by the passage of the moon. Right. Um, but are there physical ways to damp the the oscillations of any frequency so that they yes. don't become a problem? Okay. You, you could be clever about the way the elevator's cars go up and down. Uh, you can modulate the speed or you could send another elevator up uh, at, a, at a particular interval after the first one goes up so that the oscillations might counter one another. So there are ways to do that. Other ways to do it would be to have active control at the uh, at the counterweight or the the apex of the of the uh, space elevator. Uh, so there are many many ways you could handle the dynamics of of induced oscillations and things like that. Okay, well that's good to know. Um, <laughs> right, all these things are are engineerable. Um, uh, issues that that hopefully go away with the right design. Well, this is actually a, a central point to what we're doing in in ISIC. Uh, we try to identify all the hazards and, and problems. Mm -hmm. And then uh, our work is uh, almost 100% uh, just ticking through the list. Say, well, what about this problem? We'll look at that and try to identify whether or not it is a, a problem that would kill the whole concept. And uh, mm -hmm. one of the first projects of, uh, of ISEC was to look at space debris. And so there was a year long study done in 2010 on how serious is that problem? Because that's one of the first things that people usually ask you about. And uh, they determined then that it was a manageable problem given all the stuff that's up there. Um, mm -hmm. And the basically you're helped out by the vastness of space, mm -hmm. but um, the density of debris is not yet at a point where it would be a problem, but there are ways to manage impacts and uh, also to uh, be on the lookout for the for the um, particular debris. You can induce an oscillation. So let's say the space station is going by. You know the period. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is induce an oscillation in the space elevator that it will uh, conveniently miss as it passes by. You have to have a little bit of forewarning and mm -hmm. and of course you could have an unfortunate timing where two things are passing by in quick succession and you can't avoid both of them i guess but that's probably um mm -hmm. exceedingly rare um, yeah pretty much pretty much and then that study was repeated in uh 20 2020 i think 2020 yes uh because now there's all this talk of um uh constellations of communication satellites mm -hmm. Lots yeah. more things coming up, uh, collisions with satellites. Uh, and even so, uh, we, we had uh, information, all the information for the new bodies from NASA. And 
it still looks like things are feasible. So well, that's really the debris problem is a manageable problem, and and certainly we need to do things to to reduce it. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I mean, debris is a problem in almost every area of space operations, and so uh, you know we we've talked with some of our other uh, uh, guests about uh, different ways to mitigate debris. That's an ongoing conversation, um, but it looks like we're on our way to at least being able to reduce the uh, mm -hmm. uh, the density somewhat, mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully it becomes an overall manageable problem in the future. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess, you know, another question we, we might have is about the, I don't want to skip around too much, but I guess maybe the next question is, so the cost. So let's say that you know, there is something that happens to the elevator and we have to abandon it, build another one. I mean, is this sort of like all the world's resources can barely afford one of these or can we build, you know, one one a month? Or, I mean, where are we in terms of the affordability of this? It sounds exceedingly complicated to, to construct, even if the material were available. Anyway, so, yeah, we don't still know exactly how it's going to be constructed, but uh, we can estimate uh, given given the uh, the invention of of large area graphene molecules, which we think could happen any time, but uh, let's just assume that happens, then I think we're talking on the order of uh, uh, ten billion for the first ribbon, wow. and that's uh, that's a lot, but yeah, it's one of those things like uh, the transcontinental railroad where mm -hmm. the first track was very expensive. And as soon as you had that first track, the first thing they did was build a second track. Yeah. The first track was actually terrible quality and <laughs> uh, didn't last very long. So they built another track and that's what would happen in the space elevator. Mm -hmm. Once that first ribbon was up there, you can use it to get the second one up. And so there would be a network of these things, perhaps uh, at least six to begin with. Mm. Uh, at various places around the world, uh, on the equator, we think. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the time you get that those first six up, uh, the economics of it really starts to amortize. And so um, it's, it's, a, mm. it's a very close analogy to the Transcontinental Railroad. The cost of uh, mm. moving people and goods went down exponentially after that. And uh, the same thing would happen for the space elevator. So yes, um, tens of billions of dollars to start with and, and decreasing as time goes on. Well, and honestly, I mean, of course it's a lot for any one person or even company, but this is not, I mean, this is not difficult for a government to, to pay for itself. If the United States wanted to, they could just write a check for $20 billion, oh, yeah. dollars, get it, yes. get it yeah. done. Yeah, 10 billion, yeah, given, Scales of some infrastructure projects is, is a lot less than I was expecting for, for a space elevator, for sure. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I think uh, we, we have we have a ton more questions to ask you, and I think uh, maybe maybe I will queue one up uh, for a couple of minutes from now uh, about how space elevators might put rockets out of business or not. But before we go there, um, we're we're starting something uh, new. And that is that we are giving away a uh, a T-shirt to a random listener or viewer every uh, every episode, and so now is the time in the program for us to do our drawing uh, in order to announce the winner. Uh, so you can bear with me for a minute. Um, I'm going to pull yeah, up that well, list. Well, just pulling up that list. Um, just to anybody uh, you know listening or watching, uh, if you want to uh, join us, uh, you know, for any reason, but uh, be part of this uh, uh, giveaway contest. You can just reach out to us in the kind of the standard ways, email, uh, Twitter, and Facebook are, are great ways to get a hold of us. And uh, links for all that are going to be in the description, uh, you know, below your podcast or video. And, and we'll go through that at the end of the show too. So um, that just, you know, gets you involved, lets us know that you're listening and, and we can uh, we can put you on the list for uh, for fun stuff like this too. All right. So uh, with no further ado, let me roll the dice here. And... Okay, we have our winner for, for this week's episode. The winner is Khan Ame. Khan Ame. If that is you, uh, yes, send us an email to our future in space at orbitalassembly.com and uh, give us your coordinates and we'll send out a uh, well, we're not really sure what we're gonna send you. It might it might be a hat, 
It might be a uh, T-shirt or something that we uh, have uh, in our goodie bag that's still being made, but we will uh, definitely get something out to you. Please respond within 30 days. Otherwise, you're going to have to forfeit your prize. Mm -hmm. So, um, Jeff has a right. lot of patience. 30 days. <laughs> 30 days. <laughs> I think it's reasonably long. Yeah. Um, okay, so back to the uh, scheduled program. Um, so, yes, rockets, space elevators, can they, uh, can can they, they work coexist. together? <laughs> What's that? Yeah, can they coexist, right? Can they can they coexist? Is there enough room in this lunchroom for both of us? Yeah. We yeah. we tend to think that they will have to coexist. Of course, the first uh space elevator that is put up will depend entirely on rockets. We'll have to send up some kind of satellite that can assemble this thing in orbit. So we'll have to do the lamination of those many thousands of layers together to make the cable. And then it'll have to pay, be paid downward to the Earth, part of it, and, and another part will have to uh, go outward to uh, maintain the position on geosynchronous orbit. So you'll have to send a rocket up, and we'll need that for the first uh, first phase of this. But assuming that that's all there and we're operational in one way or another, then space elevators, at least uh, in their first generation, will probably never be transporting people. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that we expect these elevator cars to travel between 300, 200 and 300 kilometers per hour uh, up and down the tether. Mm -hmm. And that speed is more or less determined by the size of the Coriolis effect that I mentioned before. If it goes too fast, it could drag the cable to one side a bit and induce oscillation. So we want to be uh, away from that speed as much as we can. Um, it also is possible that uh, we don't really know what this cable would be like with high-speed rollers going up and down it all the time. So it might be wear and tear on the cable and things like that. So there are reasons that we would at first at least limit the velocity to, uh, well, let's say 300 kilometers per hour or, or less. At like that speed, train, I guess. Yeah. Like a bullet train, yes, mm -hmm. yes. And at that speed, it's going to take um, about a week to get to geosynchronous mm -hmm. orbit. Now, that's great for freight, um, and it would take a very patient person, I think, to be cooped up in an elevator car for <laughs> a week. Uh, but there's another problem. Uh, I think somewhere I have a picture of the magnetosphere with the... Oh, yes, yes, yes. So here's this gives you a, a scale. Now this is the scale. So this is a picture mm -hmm. I took from uh, from NASA mm -hmm. and superimposed on that the green line, which is how far the space elevator would extend from the Earth, and you can see so it, it goes beyond the bow shock. Mm -hmm. And so we've got the solar wind coming in, and mm -hmm. it's hitting the bow shock and it's creating this uh, this um, well uh, basically distorting the magnetosphere. But uh, if you see now uh, going inward, you see those pink lobes. Those are the Van Allen belts. And so that's the most intense part of the radiation. And, and that's right. Uh, just to, again, for people who aren't able to see the visuals, what's the altitude of those um, uh, Van Allen belts compared to the uh, full extent of the, of the Right. They're about, um, oh, they're, mm, I would say between a half, well, more like uh, two tenths of an Earth radius out to about one and a half to two Earth radii. Okay, so sort and of so, roughly uh, two thousand to twenty thousand kilometers, something roughly. like that. Yeah, I, I don't have the uh, the exact number, um, but, yeah, but um, they're yeah. they're they're far away from the Earth's surface. So you know, for example, International Space Station, you know, the space shuttles, uh, all the sort of lower Earth orbit activity is beneath that, right? You know, when you're operating from four or 500 kilometers above the surface of the earth, the Van Allen belts don't start until around, you know, that kind of 2000 benchmark. But right. when we're talking about a space elevator that goes all the way to geo, which is 35,000 kilometers plus, mm -hmm. uh, you're definitely then traveling through those, those mm -hmm. radiation belts there. Right, right. And so you can't spend a week in them. And uh, the Apollo astronauts got away with that because they went so quickly through them. Mm -hmm. right. And that's why we're still going to need rockets for some time, I think, because if you want to get out there safely, 
you have to go quickly. Now there is a way that the space elevator could do it. You could imagine some some uh, passive shielding, which would be heavy, or some active shielding for the radiation. But uh, I think that's uh, really for the future, and the, and the main utility mm -hmm. of the space elevator will be freight. And so, yeah. where it really excels rockets is massive freight delivery to orbit. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. uh, we estimate that uh, you could probably put things up for for. Uh, hundreds of dollars instead of thousands of dollars per kilogram and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so you could see that the, the, the they would certainly be complementary in, in various tasks. And uh, you could even imagine that, uh, I mean, we're talking, um, let's talk about Starship and, and refueling and uh, on orbit refueling of satellites. Um, the space elevator could easily be a good way to put up fuel. Mm -hmm. And then the rockets sure. could, uh, dock with a, a depot and, and take the fuel there yeah well, i imagine that it's it's also a, quite a bit more energy efficient even if it isn't significantly cheaper and i'm imagining that one day it could be but you know we it, uh, the reusable rockets are aiming for sub 100 dollars a kilogram as well mm -hmm. that's probably to low earth orbit not all the way out that's to geo true. or beyond that you're talking but um this seems like a very energy efficient way because we are beating the rocket equation right mm -hmm. so we're not having to bring many times our weight in in propellant um in terms of how much electricity it takes to move that climber up to the end point compared to how much energy it would take to make that same amount of propellant are we are we way ahead when it comes to comes to efficiency yep yep and it really depends on where you deliver so if you deliver to geosynchronous orbit it's it's far ahead um mainly because you get up to that point and you can just let things go. You can have a little spring to drive it off and it's already in orbit. And so uh, rockets uh, obviously have to spend a lot more fuel to get there. It's fairly easy for them to get to low Earth orbit. But to get up to geo, they need an extra booster or you know certainly more fuel. And so at that point, the space elevator really wins. And mm -hmm. if you're doing anything involving uh, deeper space operations, you know, cislunar uh, asteroids, planets, then you start to take advantage of the upper end of the space elevator. Right. There I'm you have an image uh, of, of that yeah. to sort of help you explain that. So you have that okay. counterweight out there. And as I mentioned before, that's uh, according to the model that uh, we're using right now for the space elevator, that is uh, at least uh, three times longer than it uh, shows on that diagram. Mm. So it, it's way out there. Uh, so yeah, 35,000 kilometers is the geosynchronous, and then we're going all the way out to 100,000. Now, at that radius, that point is going fast enough that if you release something from it, it mm -hmm. could reach the inner asteroid belt mm -hmm. without any, I mean, it would obviously mid-course corrections and things, so you'd have to have mm -hmm. some fuel for that, but you would not need any serious boosting to get out that far. And uh, people have thought of various augmentations to the counterweight mm -hmm. to send things out even further. So you can reach some tremendous velocities mm -hmm. at this mm -hmm. point. You could even imagine getting to Mars, for example, in a much shorter time. We estimated about uh, 60 days instead of oh. a year and a half. Because you can mm -hmm. simply throw it at, as highest speed as possible rather than just the minimum you need to get out of Earth's orbit and mm -hmm. onto exactly. Mars, right? Exactly. And then all the work comes, of course, when you have to uh, slow yourself down yeah. when you're getting close yeah. to Mars. But again, that's a, a great reduction in fuel. Mm -hmm. So you'll still need rockets there, but you can get the first part and most of the distance uh, just from uh, no energy expenditure once you're at the counterweight. Boy, that's really incredible. I mean, I can see this as being such an enabler to a future solar system economy, at least an inner solar system economy, and maybe beyond. As you said, the asteroid belts are kind of just before the outer planets. Um, but I, I guess I have to ask the question, okay, you've, you've shown us that the availability of these tether materials is getting close. But do we need, I, I maybe just ask the question, do we need this technology today? I mean, sure, it'd be great to get to the asteroids without fuel, but we're not really 
there yet, right? So does this make sense for us to be building this, say, in the next decade or two? I um, think so. Your... There are a lot of reasons that you might want to do it, and they're all they all have to do with getting a lot of tonnage into orbit. So um, Elon Musk, I'm, I'm sure you all heard, wants to put uh, a, a, a city or a village on Mars, and he mm -hmm. estimates to do that will require a million tons into space. Now, if you look at, um, I just looked up the uh, the maximum payload for the Starship with a booster, and that's about 100 tons. And so with those numbers, and um, let's see, a million tons, that's 10,000 launches. Yeah. So if he's going to put that, that much mass into orbit, then that's about five and a half launches per day for five years. It seems like a practical problem. And mm -hmm. if you had a space elevator, uh, that could go on day in, day out, uh, just accumulating almost as much mass as you wanted to uh, in uh, geosynchronous orbit, which is better than he wants because he wants to get it up to low Earth orbit. Right. Uh, so you actually have a, hmm, yeah. a, you have a starting point, which is higher, and therefore it takes less energy to get where you're going if you can get all the way to geo or beyond. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think another really relevant application is going to be space solar power. Mm. So these mm -hmm. space solar power satellites are going to be rather massive things. And the, let me see if I get my figures straight. The, um, mm. oh, the proposed uh, UK proposal for a space solar power satellite, 2000 tons for two gigawatts. And mm. if you're going to, let's say, replace the current, solar generation on earth that's about what 850 gigawatts <laughs> so mm. that's that's uh uh that's a lot of launches and so wow um, yeah that's like on the order of building a city on mars right about the same order mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and so the same number of launches and so you have two i guess you would call them two mega projects that could easily be supported by space elevator at uh, what seems to be a massive advantage in efficiency. Mm -hmm. And these yeah, are love... mega projects that we're already talking about now, right? It's not mm -hmm. this, you know, science fiction in a hundred years type of a type of thing. Right. Well, I guess the real advantage is, you know, if this becomes a commodity where you have a number of the, I can imagine you'd said six at the minimum. So I could imagine like a dozen or even more, elevators spaced out around the equator belonging to different nations or, or company, you know, consortiums. And it becomes something where you, you know, it's just whatever is the cheapest way to get into orbit. Uh, and I guess for certain advantages, you're still going to, uh, for certain conditions, you're still going to want to use rockets, even if they are super cheap. But boy, this is just going to be a boon to the entire industry, I would imagine. Yes, I, indeed. Yeah. Yep. It's similar to how, you know, you mentioned the transcontinental railroad. I mean, a lot of goods are still shipped via train across the United States. We also have semi trucks. Right. We also have, you know, airplanes. You know, I can get a, you know, UPS uh, package delivered in a day to New York, you know, on an airplane. But I could also, you know, still use a train. And there are different reasons that you use right. either of those. So. Yep. Yeah, not just speed. There's speed, which is obviously a big one. But there's also how big of a package you can send. Mm -hmm. Is it refrigerated? you know, vibration, other kinds of trade-offs, right? Yeah, so I can see a, the same. That's a good thing. analogy to the space elevator rocket uh, mm -hmm. situation, planes and trains and boats. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. So well, you, mentioned, um, uh, uh, you mentioned space solar power, right? And so, you know, we, we, we've established you have some ribbon, you know, maybe it's curved so that something can't go through the entire, you know, you know entire width of it. Uh, but, you know, and, you mentioned space solar power, right? Like that could be launching these huge satellites. But what about, you know, having a solar panel, you know, farm at the at the counterweight? Can we can we use this cable to transport other things besides climbers? Uh, one of our one of our uh, regular viewers uh, asked about rocket fuel. Could we could we use this, you know, the cable to transport rocket fuel and pump it up to, uh, to geo as well? 
Yeah, I mean, it, I haven't looked at that myself, but it sounds like something that could be done if you made a tube. Now, making sure that that tube can um, hold hydrogen or uh, liquid oxygen or something like that, I don't know. But you could imagine that once you got it pumping, uh, you could start uh, taking advantages of the same forces to get that stuff thrown out at a, at a, at a higher radius. Um, that is conceivable. The um, Graphene is an extremely interesting material. It has so many superlative powers. Uh, one thing is it's very, very uh, conductive. Mm. And so you ah. can think of that as a power cable. Yes. Oh, very interesting. So the whole thing, um, Dennis, or would it just be a portion? I mean, you wouldn't want to make the whole thing conductive. I mean, uh, carrying um, a high voltage, would you? Um, you could. The, the only real problem with that would be in the case of solar storms. So if you had, um, let's say, uh, uh, one of those big X-class storms, so a coronal mass ejection or something like that, um, and the biggest one, I think, was 1858 or something like that. If you had one of that size, then the interaction of the particles with the conduction in the tether with the uh, with the current and the tether could deviate that whole thing by about six degrees either way from vertical wow. so that's a lot and um mm -hmm. it could probably handle it but i uh i wouldn't want to make that um a, a guarantee that it's going to stay up under those kind of conditions so yeah you'd have to perhaps moderate it and then of course you're still going to have losses and it's going to radiate a lot of power yeah. so those problems have to be worked out but uh i think at least for some part of the distance, you could you could think of it as a uh, yeah. as a power cord. Uh, very cool. Well, I mean, clearly we're we're sort of you know starting to brainstorm, as I'm sure many many people in your community do all the time. But to remain focused on what is really needed, I, I guess I'm just kind of curious before we wrap up here. What is the main problem that the ISIC you know, group is focused on these days. I mean, you want to see this become a reality. So what is the, what's the key one or two areas that you as a group are, are working on? Well, I'll, I'll um, yeah, uh, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll just talk about the study that I happen to be running right now. And uh, sure. so I'll, I'll call that key. Uh, we do have other things, other groups of us uh, work on uh, having to do with the, the architecture of, the whole space elevator system and uh, where you put them, how you use them for uh, containerized shipping and, and things like that and, and the economic impact. Mm -hmm. um, the particular study that, uh, that I'm running now has uh, people from quite a few disciplines. We have the, one, of, one, of the, one of the guys who's, uh, whose company is trying to produce the graphene in large amounts is on the study. We have uh, professional mechanical engineers who are working on the climber design. And so that particular study has already told us that there are some drawbacks to the material that we want. And one of them is shear force. So you have this climber, this elevator car, and we decided that it would probably be opposing wheel rollers that grip the tether. And so now you have let's say 12,000 layers of this uh, uh, graphene, and we've somehow assembled them together. If you do nothing more than just bring them together by Van der Waals forces, then they don't have enough shear strength to support the weight of the climber. So the, the climber wheels would just strip off the outer layers. Oh, wow. So That's we funny. identified that in the study and said, well, is that a problem? And uh, uh, Adrian, the uh, the uh, Adrian Nixon, who's who's uh, trying to manufacture this, said uh, we think we can solve that. So the the interesting chemistry of graphene is that uh, mm. if you let them come together naturally in sort of what we call A B stacking, I think uh, we have a molecular uh, stick and ball model. There you go. So the mm. top right model is one layer of graphene on top of the other and, and one of the carbons on the top layer sits on the void of the carbon ring in the bottom layer that's okay. what we call a b stacking that's the tightest uh stacking you can get and the strongest van der force 
but that's not enough to uh, prevent the shear. He thinks that you can take advantage of an unused bond in the graphene and mm -hmm. change it from what we call the sp2 hybrid bond now that that uh, makes up these hexagonal rings to an sp3 bond which is the diamond bond so if you right periodically press pressure along these laminations that you're building you can vastly increase the strength in other words you're cross bonding one layer to the other so that right. well above the shear force that we would generate. So essentially you're making an, sorry, and before I ask my question, so is the lower right diagram here showing that? or is that The lower something? right diagram, yes. So there, there are two layers of graphene that you can see above and below. And then in between, you can see a few carbon atoms that mm -hmm. are forming the crosslink. And those are the so-called uh, SP3 bonds that are linking these two layers together. And they, and they actually make a little dimple in this uh, flat plane. That's almost like pressing together uh, uh, rivets or something. I mean, not yes. quite, you're squeezing, but yeah. Okay, so my question is, um, so essentially you're periodically making little bits of diamond structure in this. Uh, if mm -hmm. you had the ability to make the entire cable out of diamond structured carbon, would that be like another you know, a couple orders of magnitude stronger, or is that not really what we'd want to it do? It probably would. It probably mm -hmm. would. I, at this point, I couldn't tell you what the manufacturing process for that would be. <laughs> yeah. Uh, nor could I tell you the properties of this uh, uh, diamond uh, two-dimensional material. But yes, yeah, strong for certain. Yeah. yeah. So what about, you know, uh, obviously we're pretty forward looking on this podcast you know and and there are a lot of a lot of you know sci-fi novels that use space elevators as um mm -hmm. you know as as i guess the technology right so mm -hmm. you know it, for example the mars trilogy by kim stanley robinson or the uh the new foundation series i think it was on apple tv um you know based on of course isaac asimov's great novels um, you know, when, when we see, uh, you know, references to space elevators and in, in media like that, you know, how how do they do, on, you know, on average? Are, are these, tend, do these tend to be pretty, you know, close depictions of what we, we actually might end up with? Or um, are they kind of, uh, you know, tend to be much more on the fantasy side of, of the sci-fi? I think in the, the, uh, the Robinson novels, uh, the thing that bothered me was the elevator came down and it wrapped itself around the planet with an almost indestructible material. <laughs> um, and uh, that, uh, that wouldn't happen. The, okay. Take an example with the space elevator around Earth. If you would have a, a micrometeorite impact at uh, low Earth orbit, where it's most likely, then that part of it would fall down to the earth and most likely disintegrate. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's not indestructible. It, it will probably fall into pieces because of the stresses and, and um, uh, that kind of thing. The vast majority of the space elevator that is above the, the severance would slowly drift outward. It wouldn't all come down and wrap around the planet. So, in fact, yeah, it would slowly drift outward at such a slow rate that it would give you time to recover it. Interesting. Hmm. I guess that's mm -hmm. because the the in in the normal operating situation, right? The center of mass of that elevator is is centered at geo at that orbit, right? The, the center so of force would be at, at geo. Yeah, yeah. It would mm -hmm. it would continue that orbit, but then you cut off the bottom of it. So that shifts the center of gravity and it would start drifting outwards. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it, it seems like not, not particularly quickly. Huh? Yeah, the, the mechanics of it are really quite interesting. Uh, you remember the analogy I was talking about earlier with stretching out the satellite. If you keep stretching it out, uh, then you reach a point where the, the end of it toward the Earth is just floating there. And, and uh, yeah. um, the other part way out uh, beyond the, at the counterweight is just floating there. And it's all still stretched. It's all naturally uh, vertical because of the gravitational gradient. So it naturally wants to be in that situation. But if you basically tugged at the earth end, 
then it would slowly, slowly, slowly start to come down. So it would take a long time unless you corrected it. Um, but of course, when you build such a thing, it would be anchored and you would have uh, tensioning devices. But uh, it naturally wants to stay vertical and stay in place. You just kind of have to and grab onto it, it and, and put a climber there. And mm. Yeah, as, as a, soon as you a... start putting weight on it, then it's going to start wanting to come down. Uh, but you're going to have to counteract that with, uh, with um, weights above. Yeah, so that, that's what the counterweight's for, and and I I guess you'd probably be moving that around or you know changing its center of gravity based on how the climbers are doing and and where the mass shift is. is that's going. right. Um, we had a, a question chat. I'd like to I'd like to pop in here, um, which kind of gets to something that Jeff and I had had talked about, but but hadn't had a chance to ask. Uh, you know, what about you know we've been talking about space elevators on Earth, right? You know, this you know where where your geocentric orbit is or sorry your your geosynchronous orbit is at 35,000 kilometers you know above the surface plus a little bit um what about space elevators on other planets if we're talking about the moon or mars does it make more sense to you know to start there versus you know versus at earth um in material wise would it be easier to find building materials for a space elevator on on the moon or mars than it would be here on earth you could build one now on the moon, mm -hmm. the materials mm -hmm. exist that are strong enough, um, and so yeah, if you uh, if you have the wherewithal to get your materials there and start building something, that is quite possible. There's a complication uh, due to the extreme length. So this space elevator from Earth is a uh, hundred thousand kilometers long. The one from the moon would be even longer. The, mm -hmm. the the gravitational spheres are of course different. So from the Earth, you're just dealing with essentially with Earth gravity, and the Moon is a perturbation. If you start from the Earth, you don't have, or from the Moon, you don't have to go very far out to start defeating that, and you very soon get into the Earth's gravitational sphere. So the Earth's gravity actually helps to stabilize the lunar space elevator. Hmm. So it's it's qualitatively different that way, and that may cause some com uh, some complications. I haven't worked that one out, but uh, there are groups who would like to start that way, and uh, even for the uh, Earth space elevator, our priority is to get something built from Earth first. Mm -hmm. Right. But you could see that uh, lunar space elevator would tell us a lot about yeah. how the dynamics work, and and so we could learn something from from that. Um, Mars. Uh, I think we could still build something today if we could get some stuff to Mars. Um, yeah, don't have a lot of infrastructure there yet. <laughs> right. And that that's the key, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess that, that math all works out differently, right? With the, the moon, its its rotational period is the same as its revolutionary period around Earth, right? We're always looking at the same side of the moon. So it's spinning a lot slower every 28 days compared to Earth's every one day, right? Right, and so that's why it would end up being longer, because you have to find the point in the orbit around the moon, even though it's a lighter planetary body or less massive planetary body. It it's ro ro rotation. It's the rotational velocity is certainly smaller, oh. and it's not enough to uh -huh. significantly compensate the, the gravity. And so you really do need the Earth's gravity to stretch that cable. Interesting. So you kind of yeah. you then stretch a cable from the face of the moon that we see straight at the earth until the earth mm. is pulling that cable down. Exactly. That's really That's a, fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. More and complex. Then on, yeah. On Mars, mm. you're not dealing with that, you know, having a bigger body close by and the Mars, uh, Mars, Martian day is around 26 hours, a little longer, if I recall correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, a little less uh, than so, that, but just yeah. slightly longer than the earth. Yeah. Yeah. Slightly longer than the earth, but the, the planet, you know, has, a lot less mass, right? About a third the mass of Earth. Mm -hmm. So in that case, you would end up with a shorter uh, uh, tether. Is that right? Or, or one that doesn't need to be as strong and use this, you know, graphene that we haven't yet manufactured. That's right. Yeah, it could be uh, could be much shorter. And uh, people are already looking uh, at using the moons mm -hmm. as a base for a tether system. And so uh, that would be a good place to test tether dynamics as well. Oh, you mean not, uh, in other words, build it off of a, a, a moon or asteroid where the gravity is very feeble and then right. as a proof of principle? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then as long as you've got some rotational speed, mm -hmm. uh, you can start throwing things off the moons. 
<laughs> right. So yeah, you can almost imagine like going to uh, Didymos, you know, where we just had the asteroid redirect. Yeah. I mean, we wouldn't go all the way there, but I'm just thinking of an example of a of a tiny asteroid that does spin. Almost all asteroids spin appreciably, mm -hmm. and you could you could demonstrate far from Earth so that it's safe, uh, and and work out all of the dynamics. I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what one last question I have before the pen or my penultimate. Uh, question, and then I have one more. Is so just quickly, you said that you could build a lunar space elevator out of materials that we have today. So, what material would that be? Could we use a steel cable in that case, or does it have no, to be? No, you still bit? couldn't use cable. It would have to be, uh, I think, Kevlar would work. Uh, there's another material called mm -hmm. uh, Dyneema. Okay. I, I don't know what that is, but uh, I'm guessing it's similar to, to, to Kevlar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. Okay, so mm -hmm. um, a lightweight polymer. Um, well, my last question is, uh, what did we forget to ask you that's important to mention about space elevators? Hmm. hmm. I think um, from from my point of view, it's it's uh, thinking thinking on the large term. I I, I tend to view it as as. Uh, Mankind's first astronomical scale engineering project. Mm. Mm -hmm. So it is, um, you know, economically like uh, like a transcontinental transcontinental railroad, or uh, more likely a bridge, a bridge to the solar system. And so it is really uh, a revolutionary thing, and really could make a huge economic difference to getting into space and uh, and. Uh, I mean, I, I tend to look at it as an, a, a, a huge example for uh, exploration of the solar system. Uh, other people look more at the economics, but uh, mm -hmm. you can imagine just about any size payload. So you're no longer limited by the diameter of the of the cargo bay of whatever rocket you're using. Um, it's a very gentle takeoff, so you don't have to have the uh, the shock of, of mm -hmm. rocket launches. And so you could have some rather fragile equipment launched into deep, deep space. Uh, it just mm -hmm. opens up so many possibilities that we haven't even thought of before. And the scale, it causes you to rethink uh, what is possible and and how to deal, how to get your mind to deal with that. It's We're, we're talking with, with looking at the space elevator uh, by itself, we're talking in going from atomic scale to planetary scale. Yeah. And you have to consider all those effects. So I think that is um, the philosophical aspect for me is, is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would make yeah. a great central project for humanity and mm. pooling that science and engineering and, and finances and, and, you know, all linking all these economies. Mm -hmm. I, I think mm -hmm. that's, that's a great way to say it. You're, you're going from that atomic scale to the, to the planetary scale and, and, you know, in one project, in one yep. item. That's, yep. that's really neat. Well, Dennis, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. We're we're at time here, but uh, uh, I think that was a great conversation and, and a wonderful kind of introduction to, to space elevators. And, and you know, I thank think you. Yes, I enjoyed this. Yeah, hopefully our our listeners too kind of get a feel for what what we could use something like this for, and you know, and how you know realistic in and not science fiction that that this technology is. So thank you for joining us. Uh, for everyone listening, uh, you know, it, uh, please reach out to us if you if you want to you know be part of the conversation. Um, suggestions for for topics you'd like to hear about, uh, people you'd like to see us interview, or or anything else, uh, just reach out. Uh, email is a great way. Uh, our future in space at orbitalassembly.com, uh, but we're also on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, Twitter is at our future space, and Facebook is our future in space. So we'd love to uh, love to see you uh, there and, and engage with you uh, all that way. So thank you so much for listening. And if you like what we're doing at Orbital Assembly and would like to find out ways to contribute more, feel free to reach out to us at info at orbitalassembly.com. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Till next time. Bye-bye. This program represents the personal opinions of the hosts and their guests. 
The content, opinions, and views do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of Orbital Assembly Corporation, nor the organizations with which any of the program participants may be affiliated. The mere appearance or promotion of this program does not constitute an endorsement by Orbital Assembly Corporation or its affiliates. Our Future in Space. Copyright 2022, Orbital Assembly Corporation. Hosts, Dr. Jeff Greenblatt. Eric Ward, audio and video production by Tim Alatori. Musical theme, The Last Day by Dark Blue Studio.